Good evening. Uh, I'm Armand Kuragian, uh, the president of AUA, and I welcome you all here. A few things before I start. Um, this uh, event, as well as uh, this, the entire series, are being live streamed uh, here by Armenian Virtual College. They're also being recorded by uh, our uh, communications people. Um, those who are viewing uh, through live streaming, uh, they can participate in the questions and answers. Uh, so if questions are asked, uh, uh, they, uh, we, we will be hearing somehow, I don't know exactly how, but it, we will be, res be able to respond to those questions. Uh, also, uh, the videos of these lectures will be on uh, our social media and website, and so those who unfortunately will be missing because, partly because of the uh, traffic conditions, very difficult traffic conditions, they can view this first lecture on the website, and then the next two lectures will also be on the website. Um, also, uh, the uh, lectures are being translated into Armenian. Rema menk anmicha kan tarkmanutun ga hayreni, yevite pet kunek hayren oblaselu entega kanja kaler kan vurtegan. And I and tadici hete bi masum karog ekstana la kanja kaler vur pesi. Karonak Lesel Hyrenov, Yete Petketa. Remitas Hostuni of Hartsupataskana, Metsma Sampline Luan, Kone, Metsma Sampline Luan, Agler, and here we Karelia Hartsalin in Hyrenov. This year marks the centennial of the First Armenian Republic. Established on May 28, 1918, the First Republic laid the grounds for the Second Republic during the Soviet years and now the Third Republic as of September 21, 1991. Incidentally, that date is also the date of opening of this university. As a university, the best way for us to commemorate this anniversary is to provide a scholarly examination of its history and significance. There is no scholar in this world who is more qualified to speak about this subject than Professor Richard Hovanesian. His four volumes on the history of the First Republic, which are now all translated into Armenian and Russian, are the definitive works on the subject. He has been a sought-after speaker for many years, but this year he is engaged in numerous communication, com commemorative events throughout the world. I think we are fortunate to have him this week for this series of lectures. I would like to point out that his four volumes in the First Republic, on the First Republic, as well as his other published books, are available in our library in a large collection donated by Professor Vanessian himself. I'm very grateful uh, to the Armenian General Belevant Union, uh, represented here by the president of AGBU Armenia, Vasken Yahubian, for sponsoring this lecture series and uh, so I want to publicly uh, acknowledge the sponsorship and also AVC that is doing the live streaming is uh, also one of the projects that uh, AGBU has started in Armenia. So I'm very thankful. Uh, Richard uh, Hovanesian is the first holder of the Armenian Educational Foundation Chair in Modern Armenian History at the University of California, Los Angeles better known as UCLA. Uh, he's President's Fellow at Chapman University and Adjunct Professor of History at the University of Southern California to work with the Shoah Foundation on Armenian survivor testimonies. A native of California, he received his BA and MA in History from the University of California at Berkeley and his PhD in History from UCLA. A member of the UCLA faculty since the 1960s, 
He organized both the undergraduate and graduate programs in Armenian history and served as the associate director of UCLS Center for Near Eastern Studies for 20 years. One could call him as the father of Armenian studies in the United States. Uh, Professor Hovanesian is a Guggenheim Fellow and has received many honors for his scholarship, civic activities, and support of individual and collective human rights, including medals and encycl encyclicals for His Holiness Karakin I and Karakin II of Holy See of Echmiadzin, and from His Holiness Kar Karakin II and Aram I of the uh, Great House of Cilicia. He is a founder and six-time president of the Society for Armenian Studies and has given more than 2,500 lectures and media presentations on Armenian history and issues in 45 countries. Richard Ovanesian represented the state of California on the Western Interstate Commission for Higher Education for 15 years and has served as a consultant to the California State Board of Education authoring the chapter on the Armenian Genocide in the state's social studies model curriculum on human rights and genocide. In 1990, he was elected to the Armenian Academy of Sciences, becoming the first social science living, uh, scientist living abroad to be so honored. As I mentioned, Professor Ovanesian has published more than 30 books, including four volumes on the First Republic, which are not translated into Armenian and Russian, six volumes on the Armenian Genocide, and 14 volumes on historic Armenian cities and provinces in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, also, as I mentioned, these volumes are all available in our library, and uh, I hope that you'll have a chance to view them and hopefully borrow them. Our library is open to the public in general. So it is my distinct honor and pleasure to introduce Professor Richard Hovenesi. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Derbudegian, and uh, thank you for the invitation to be here. I know our numbers are a bit um, low today, but I'm glad on the other hand that uh, we have in our streets the ability to have some civil disobedience and civil protest, uh, which is a hallmark of uh, aspiring democracies, and I hope we're uh, moving, uh, moving in that uh, direction. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Der Gurerian and the American University of Armenia, the Armenian General Benevolent Union, for the invitation to be here and to share uh, some of my thoughts uh, on this um, important uh, anniversary, uh, the 100th anniversary of the Republic of Armenia. And I thought, uh, first I would talk a bit uh, uh, about myself, um, uh, aside from the introduction. Um, I, I was, um, let me just uh, see if I can do this properly. I'm, uh, okay. Um, I, I was born in uh, California uh, more than eight decades again ago. I'm the first generation uh, to be born uh, from the survivors who managed to make it to uh, America. My father uh, and my mother both were born in historic Armenia in the province of Kharpert. Uh, my uh, father's uh, family uh, was entirely annihilated. His mother, his brother, uh, his father, all of his village of Basmashen, uh, no one survived, or very few maybe survived with, in the, with the Bedouins and were later rescued by Near East Relief uh, and arrived in America. But my father um, survived just by chance, uh, and in this book, uh, Family of Shadows, written by Garin Hovanesian, um, is my father's uh, story, it begins with my father's story, a, a story that I didn't know most of my life because like many other survivors, Kaspar did not speak about all of the trauma and trouble that he went through and only in the last year of his life did we learn uh, that uh, he was uh, taken away from the death caravans that were going toward 
the deserts um, by Kurdish tribesmen. They took him away because he was a boy of 12 or 13 years of age and took him away to work as slave labor, as a shepherd boy, uh, and was very badly treated by these particular family of Kurds uh, for three years. And then in 1917, um, that is a third year after the beginning of the genocide, somehow there was uh, like an underground kind of um, information that was passed from one Armenian boy who was a slave to another Armenian boy. That They had heard that Antranik, uh, the famous partisan leader Antranik, with his uh, Gamavors uh, volunteers, had uh, come to Erzurum and then had gotten all the way uh, with some of his people, had gotten all the way to Erzingan. And Erzingan, or Erzinjan, as it's now known, is a neighboring district to Kharpert. And so they, were, he, they ran away from their masters at night and were helped by the Alawi Kurds of Dersim, which is a district between Kharpert and Erzingan. Uh, were able to get there, and a boy of 16 uh, picked up a gun and a rifle and a bayonet, never ever touched one before, and suddenly became a soldier uh, himself, and somehow uh, went through uh, difficulties getting to, into the Caucasus. You know that after the Russian Revolution of 1917, uh, the Russian armies withdrew from the occupied portions of Turkey, the Armenians also had to flee at that time, and my father ended up in Hususayn Govgas, in the North Caucasus. And somehow, uh, he then found himself in 1919, uh, early 1920, uh, in Bolis, in Constantinople, and he had a very distant relative, not so distant, a relative in California, who sent the $50 that was necessary for him to take the ship to come to America. And when he came to America, uh, they asked him what his name was, and he didn't give our family name, which was different, but he gave his father's first name, which is Hovanes, uh, in honor of his father, who uh, was taken away as a soldier by the Turkish authorities and either killed or worked to death in the unarmed labor battalions. And so we became Hovanesian only in 1920. Uh, as a result of my father wanting to be, remember his own father and uh, spent his life um, uh, rebuilding uh, what he could, uh, came to California, bought a small farm on which I grew up uh, and uh, ultimately prospered like most of the Armenian survivors were able to do. Um, and like many others, he didn't speak. Some spoke incessantly about what occurred uh, especially women who uh, spoke uh, continuously, were traumatized all their life. And then there were others like my father who suppressed it and, and didn't want to talk about it. And uh, we didn't, as I say, we didn't know until the very late times in his life what he had, uh, what he had been through. Um, I, um, as a youngster, uh, was not comfortable being an Armenian. Uh, I, was, I grew up in America in a very nationalistic, um, the Armenian word is Odar Adyats, Yergirer Amerikan, Oksana Yerusanagan Tvagan Derun. And we, uh, who were the first generation born there, were not secure in who we were. Our parents spoke broken English, they were not highly educated, they were peasant people. And, and we wanted to become accepted by the Americans. And so it, it took me um, some years to uh, feel comfortable with, uh, with being an Armenian. It took some effort, but I'm glad that ultimately um, I found the road to do that, um, partly because of people whom I met along the way. And um, I always had this dream of knowing that there had been an Armenian state in 1918. I didn't know much about it, but I was a dreamer and I dreamed about uh, a free and independent Armenia. I dreamed, and I love politics, so I dreamed about myself being a representative of Armenia in the United Nations and other such romantic ideas. But it was those romantic ideas 
that brought me to the history uh, of the uh, First Armenian Republic. Uh, in America especially, uh, this republic was very controversial. Uh, there were sides drawn. Uh, the Armenian flag was either Gbashtain, Gam Gadein. It became a symbol of partisanship and of political parties. Unfortunately, uh, lost in mythology, people really didn't know the history uh, of the Republic, and yet they drew sides, uh, and uh, it, it was a, a, a not a happy time uh, for the Armenian American community. But still, I was uh, drawn to the idea of uh, Armenian independence. Uh, I was hurt by the fact that I didn't find much about Armenia in history books. Uh, like all of us in, in the West, at least, when we got a book on the, the Middle East or on anything, we looked in the index, the first thing, to look for the word Armenia. And if we didn't find it, we were disappointed, and that happened a lot. It happened a lot. Uh, and so, um, as, I, as I grew older uh, and became more comfortable with my Armenianism, um, I know that I wanted to go into the history. Uh, my, I always loved history, and I thought, I would, wouldn't it be good if, if I could study Armenian history? But I didn't know Armenian. Uh, I couldn't, I could speak Merkharpirti Parparov uh, Ghosayink, but, uh, but, I, but I couldn't speak Armenian, and I couldn't certainly read Armenian, and if I wanted to do Armenian history, I would have to be able to read it. And it was... Um, at that time, that uh, one of the people whom I met um, was uh, the last prime minister of the First Armenian Republic, whose name was Simon Varatsyan. Uh, you know, the, the Armenian Republic had four prime ministers: uh, Kashaznyani, uh, uh, Khatisyan, Ohanjanyan, and Varatsyan. Varatsyan was only prime minister for barely a week or ten days in order to give Armenia or to negotiate with Soviet Russia or Russian representatives to uh, to give Armenia to under Soviet rule. I think Hayastana Hansnel Soviet Aganishanutyan or Besi Bahvanvir inch for Manasazir Kanivor Turkir Artin Madadzein Alexandropol as in Gumri Artin Madadzein Hayastana Gorzanman Yerzirinir. So it was a uh, uh, no, a no-choice situation in which the independent Armenia uh, at the end of 1920 uh, gave way uh, to save whatever was left, that is what we have today, by uh, allowing the Red Army to enter into Armenia and uh, declaring Armenia to become uh, a socialist Soviet, as it was then called, socialist Soviet uh, Armenian Republic. Well, the last Prime Minister, again, we rom I romanticized about him. We had this great awe of uh, a person who had been the Prime Minister. His name was, as I said, Simon Varatsyan. And after I had graduated from the University of California, I was already 22 because I had graduated and done another year to become a teacher, uh, teaching credential. Uh, he, he met me and he saw some potential in me, I suppose. I didn't, I don't know what he saw, but he saw something. And uh, he uh, suggested that I now travel uh, to Beirut, uh, because in those years it was uh, in Soviet Armenian time, um, American students didn't come here to Yerevan uh, to study. They had to go somewhere to learn Armenian. And so um, uh, the main center of Armenian life was Beirut. And so I traveled across the ocean on ship uh, to the surprise of my parents and everyone else because very few people traveled uh, uh, in that direction. And I, I spent nine months in Beirut, which are the most important months of my life probably because I was able to learn the Armenian language, living among the Armenian people of Lebanon and um, learning to read and write uh, however difficult that was for me. And this is, this is Beirut, the, the harbor of Beirut where I went. And now this is the school, it's known as the Jemaran. 
It doesn't exist anymore because of the Lebanese Civil War. Uh, that is, it, this old uh, building is no longer there. And here's a picture of that last prime minister whose name was Vratsian and uh, uh, who was the reason uh, that I ended up in Beirut to learn the Armenian language uh, and uh, have gained the tools, if you will, the tool to be able to return to America and uh, spend my life uh, studying uh, Armenian history, uh, first at the University of California at Berkeley, and then doing a PhD dissertation uh, on uh, an Armenian subject at the uh, U UCLA, at the University of California, Los Angeles. Now, this was at a time when there were no Armenian studies courses anywhere in America. Um, the, I, I, I became a professor of Armenian history without ever in my life having taken a course in Armenian history because there were no courses in Armenian history. We created them. I and a number of four or five other individuals, uh, fortunately in the 1950s, by the 1950s, where there became a greater interest in international studies, partly because of the Cold War, partly because of the Cold War and greater interest uh, in, in them, I was um, uh, able to uh, do my dissertation on an Armenian subject and then ultimately in the early 1960s to become a pioneer in teaching uh, Armenian history at a university level along with two or three other individuals in America who were at the right place at the right time to be able to do that. Um, I spent, as uh, Dr. Dergurian pointed out, uh, much of my career uh, investigating the history uh, of the Republic. Um, I wanted to take it out of the partisanship, uh, out of the mythology, uh, out of the extreme uh, love and extreme hatred, uh, and to put it into historical perspective with its good and with its bad, with its problems and with its achievements. And what I thought was going to be uh, easy uh, to write a history of Vetravis, it was only two and a half year history. It should not have taken so long to write uh, uh, the history of two and a half years. And I thought I would do it as a dissertation, but as it ended up, it took me 30 years uh, to write these volumes on the history because well, with my wife Vartiter, as we started to examine the sources, the archival sources, uh, in the United States, in Great Britain, in France, uh, in uh, Italy, uh, in Germany, and in other countries, we found that the material relating to the Armenian Republic was enormous, enormous. Just in the single archive of Avedi Saharonian, who was a representative of the Armenian Republic in Paris after World War I. In his single archive, uh, that is that Republic uh, delegation archive, there is so much material on Karabakh alone uh, that uh, it figures in the thousands of pages just on Karabakh. Uh, and for a while I thought I'd write my dissertation on the Karabakh um, uh, quarrel. And I never thought, by the way, in the 30 years that I was writing this history of uh, the first Armenian Republic, that all of these issues about which I wrote in detail would become live issues once again, that Karabakh would again become a live issue and not just a historical issue, uh, and that all these other issues of, of uh, Shircha Pagum being blockaded, of, of uh, dealing with um, not-so-reliable neighbors, uh, with economic collapse uh, within the country after independence, uh, with the struggle to create the framework of a democratic institution and democratic institu institutions uh, in, uh, in this small country um, would become live issues again, and they did. Uh, and so it's not, uh, you know, you may um, be rather surprised if you read these four volumes and go into the chapters on Karabakh alone, so much will be familiar to you because it's all came alive again uh, after 1988 and I had no idea that that was going to be the, uh, the case. Uh, so these are, this is my uh, fundamental Himnagan Ashkadanka Hayastani Hanar Bidrichan 
again, I tried to be as balanced as I could. It's not easy. No historian can be uh, fully objective. Uh, history is not a precise science. History is interpretation. It's bringing together the facts and trying to understand the facts. And I, this is what I've tried to do and tried to be as fair as I can uh, without losing my sympathy for the uh, ideal of independence. I mean, when I write about Karabakh, some people think that, oh, this is very bad that you are saying what the Azerbaijani claims are to, to Karabakh, but no. We have to know what the Azerbaijanis are claiming and why they're claiming it. Or when it comes to, to Lori or, or Akhokalak, uh, why? what are the conflicting claims between the Armenians and the Georgians? And what are the historical roots for those uh, uh, claims? This is what we have to do. And then we can make our own interpretation eventually of, of what we think. But you need to, to be as balanced. And also looking at the internal life of Armenia. We can't just present it as being a rosy, you know, as my, in my childhood image of Armenia, the Republic of Armenia, uh, oh, no, it wasn't that way. It was, it was a struggle. Uh, there was a lot of difficulty, uh, 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 famine. And, and loss of life uh, to disease, not because of anything that the Armenians did, but because of the fact that they had been in a war zone for more than four years, that all their young people in Russian Armenia had been drafted into the Russian army and taken away, that the economy in Yerevan Gubernia had already fallen to a very low level, that is loss of agricultural income. And Armenia, even in the best of times, this area of Armenia, which was the least productive part of historic Armenia, the least productive part of historic Armenia is where we are today. The rich lands of Armenia lie on the other side of the border. And on this area, this area of Yerevan had always to import grain from Russia, from South Russia, to live. Because it could not feed its own people sufficiently uh, in this small area. And suddenly, you're cut off from those supplies by a civil war in Russia. You're uh, uh, pushed and squeezed because of Turkish invasions from uh, the West. You've been betrayed, in your mind at least, by Soviet Russia, which declares the right of self-determination to the Armenian people and so forth on the one hand, but on the other hand gets out of World War I by making a treaty with Germany and Turkey and giving up all of Western Armenia, which the Russian armies had occupied in World War I. The Russian armies, along with the Armenian volunteer detachments, six volunteer detachments with Antron Ekendro and Kedi, uh, and uh, Hamas Basp and others had gotten all the way to Erzurum and Erzingan and suddenly in the beginning of 1917 when the Russian Revolution gives new life to Turkey. Turkey was defeated. Turkey was at an end in 1917. It was just waiting for the spring for the new offensive to, to uh, open up the snowbound Armenian plateaus so that the end of Ru Turkey would be brought. But again, the Russian revolutions, as in many other occasions, saved the Ottoman Empire, saved Turkey from immediate defeat. And instead, and instead, when the communists took over in November of 1917, and Lenin decided we'll have peace at any price, peace at any price. And peace at any price meant giving away uh, the Ukraine, half of the Ukraine, to Germany, uh, it meant giving away uh, Badmagan Hayastan to Turkey, but not only Badmagan, historic Armenia, to Turkey, but also Kars and Ardahan uh, to, to Turkey, and not only that, that by the Treaty of brest in March 1918. And so the Turkish armies took advantage of this upheaval 
in Russia, and the civil war between whites and reds, and made, uh, first of all, beginning in the spring of 1918, attacked to take over all of historic Armenia. And the Armenian refugees, Western Armenian refugees who had come to Yerevan and Echmiazin in 1915 and 1916, many of them returned when the Russian armies had taken over of these regions, they returned to Garin, to Erzurum, and to Van. And now a second time in 1918, they have to retreat one more time. I mean, the misery of the Armenian people, and they're concentrating in this little, terribly under, um, uh, 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 not underpopulated, but uh, uh, lack of supplies in this little area that we call Armenia today, uh, uh, packing in uh, 300,000, 400,000 Western Armenian refugees who make uh, life for the Devatsi Armenians, for the local Armenians, miserable, uh, and uh, who, who come to hate each other as uh, people who are living off this land, where, which we don't have enough for ourselves, and so the conflict between Eastern Armenian and Western Armenian, Devatsi and, and Kaftagan, uh, Pakistan is immediate in, in, in this region. So it's under those circumstances that we have to understand um, what was happening and to present this uh, in a way to, that we can uh, comprehend why there was a crisis and why it, was, why it was that the leadership of the Armenian people was reluctant in 1918 to declare Armenian independence under those circumstances with a country without resources and a country without infrastructure because the Armenian leadership was in Tiflis, not in Yerevan. They were in Tiflis. The Armenian Askain uh, Khorur, the Armenian National Council, uh, made up of the Dashatuchun, of the Jaur Tagan, uh, Ramgavar, or popular uh, people's party, uh, the socialist democrats, the socialist revolutionaries, their centers were in Tiflis. The Armenian economic, cultural, political center was not Yerevan at all. Yerevan was a sleepy, sleepy oriental town with uh, maybe 25, 30,000 people and a significant percentage of those people were not even Armenians. Uh, but it was Tiflis that was the Armenian center, and suddenly the Armenians are to find themselves in a situation where their beloved capital, Tiflis, cultural and economic and political, is no longer their capital, because in 1918 the Georgians are going to declare independence and reclaim the capital city, their historic capital city, as, as they should. Well, let me just uh, quickly tell you that after writing 30 years. I, I published my last volumes in 1996. Uh, I started in, in 1967 with uh, Armenia on the Road to Independence. Um, up until the last two volumes, I had to rely on archives from around the world except for the Ar Armenian archives. The Armenian National Archives were not available to me. They were closed. Uh, they were closed because it was Soviet times, and I was a foreign scholar, an American scholar, uh, and there was no um, access for me, even though the Soviet Armenian historians and scholars encouraged me a great deal. And uh, on the side and secretly were always telling me, you were doing that which we wish we could do, but we're not able to do. And it, but in the last two, for the last two volumes, in the late 1980s and early 1990s, in the period of uh, late Soviet and early uh, independent period, I did have access to, uh, for the last two volumes, after I had actually written them. And I was glad to see that, uh, that I had interpreted as I would have interpreted if I had had access. In other words, they did not add anything that would have changed my interpretation of the historic uh, Republic of Armenia. It gave me some additional detail, which I uh, may not have had, but enhanced the detail, but didn't change anything. 
Um, you've seen uh, that, uh, as mentioned, uh, it's been a long and difficult um, years in translating the uh, four volumes to Armenian and to uh, the Armenian used here, that is in the Reformed orthography, uh, uh, and the difficulties were not only because of translation, I had to compare with the translators, they're very good translators, but sometimes they don't understand the nuances uh, of, of the vocabulary, and so you have to be sure that they understand what you are trying to say, and then also the language in Armenia has changed a great deal. Uh, and as you know, um, much of the vocabulary uh, is, are not the good Armenian words, but have become international words. Uh, you know, why should I use the word unikal? What does unikal mean? Uh, and so I had to, I had to uh, fight, <laughs> fight in order to insist that we use the Armenian word, even though I am told and warned, I say, uh, you know, and so I, uh, I became a little stubborn on that, and I'm glad that finally, uh, last year, through the Academy of Sciences here, the support of the Academy of Sciences, these four volumes um, became available, and they're now available in bookstores, I think, somewhere in, in Yerevan. Uh, and then one volume with, uh, done with Kayana Mahmurian uh, was uh, doing a volume in Russian, on the foreign policy of the First Republic, and that is for the Russian readers uh, especially. After that, I've done the six volumes on the Armenian genocide. I don't like genocide studies. I'm not a genocide historian, but I was pushed into this field by denial of the Armenian genocide and uh, uh, published these. And the final thing that I'm proud of now uh, the final thing that I'm proud of now is starting in around 2000, I started a series of conferences at UCLA in which we focused on the historic Armenian provinces and cities and communities of the Ottoman Empire, uh, starting with Van, uh, Bitlis, Harpert, uh, Erzurum, uh, Sepastia, Dikranagerd, Gidigia, Pontos, Bolis, uh, Karzan Ani, Izmir, uh, Gesaria, Yev Kapadovkia, Pokerasia, Yev Verchina in 2016, and the Armenian communities of uh, basically of Kesab and Musadag. And so uh, in the English language, we now have available uh, these 14 volumes for non Armenian readers and also Armenian readers who don't have access to um, easily access to uh, knowing a little bit. These are not comprehensive volumes, but they tell us a little bit about each of these areas where the Armenians were, and I think we have most of the volumes in the AUA library uh, today. <coughs> this, is a, this is the map of historic Armenia, or the six vilayets in the 19th century. Uh, the Armenian question uh, became an international uh, issue of how to bring to the Armenian Christians in the Ottoman Empire their desired achievement of security of life and property. Security and life of property was the main goal of the Armenian people, reformers in the 19th century. It was not independence. Armenians did not ask for <coughs> independence in the 19th century. Perhaps because our, it was, Armenian <coughs> situation was very complicated. Armenians had now become a minority in many areas of what had once been historic Armenia. And outside of this area of the six provinces, 
there were well over a million Armenians living in other areas of the Ottoman Empire, in Giligia, in Cilicia, in, in Gesaria, in Western Asia Minor, in Bolis. Bolis, Constantinople, Istanbul, had more Armenians living there than in any other city in the Ottoman Empire, just like Tiflis was not a part of Armenia, but had more Armenians and was a cultural, economic, cultural, political center of the Armenians of the Russian Empire, so too Constantinople was the economic, uh, intellectual, uh, literary center, uh, and economic center of the Armenians of the Ottoman Empire. So the Armenians were scattered all over. Uh, and it may not be su surprising, therefore, that, uh, that the Armenian reformers of the 19th century who were begging for uh, change were not asking for independent Armenia, but were asking for a secure um, land, uh, a secure um, uh, life uh, 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 for themselves and their property. And as you well know, in these eastern provinces in particular, life was very, very um, uh, dangerous because of the Kurdish tribesmen who lived among the Armenians, who, who raided the Armenians Every year, I mean, the Armenians worked all year. So it was this kind of insecurity and taking away the young girls and so forth. So the Armenian question was one of security of life and property and ultimately became also one of local self-government. We want to have the right to have in our own district um, the right to have a local government, to have some Armenian policemen, to have some Armenian administrators in our own district. Uh, this was largely uh, what the uh, Armenian uh, question um, had been. During World War I, uh, beginning in 1914, uh, the Russian imperial authorities who had not been sympathetic to Armenian demands in Turkey, were not sympathetic to them because the Armenians could turn around and ask for the same thing in the Russian Empire. They could ask for the same thing here in Yerevan and so forth. So the imperial, you know, imperial governments don't like to give people many rights. Uh, dictatorships like to keep control uh, with a police state. Uh, that should be obvious. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so um, the, the Russians were clever under Tsar Nicholas II, the last Russian Tsar, and they showed to themselves to be sympathetic to uh, Armenian uh, claims. And they um, allowed the Catholicos, Kevor Kingerort, Catholicos Kevor V, to appoint a Boas Nubar. Pasha, uh, as a rep his representative in um, Paris to represent the Armenian cause uh, to the European powers. And they allowed um, the bureau of the uh, Armenian leadership in Tiflis to organize Armenian volunteer battalions or uh, kunder, Gamavoragan kunder, of which there were six organized. They were not huge in number, or in number of people joining, but a few thousand Armenians entered into the Armenian volunteer units as part of the Russian war effort to occupy these provinces that had been uh, uh, the center of the Armenian liberation movement. The Armenian political parties, uh, uh, starting with the Armenakan in Van, uh, which was the predecessor, one of the predecessors to the current Ramgavar party. Uh, the Tashakrachun organized in Tiflis in 1890. Uh, the, uh, the Hanchagyan party in Geneva even before that in 1887. The focus of their uh, liberation struggle was this area that you see here. It was not really focused on Yerevan. Uh, it, the oppression of the Armenians in the Russian Empire was considered less intense. And they didn't want to have a struggle on two fronts. I mean, you choose your enemy. And for them, their enemy were the Turks, 
the Turkish government and not the Tsar, even though the Tsar was not a good person. As you know, he had confiscated the properties of the Armenian church. Uh, they had become behind the struggle and the fights between Armenians and Muslims in what we call the Armeno-Tatar clashes in 1905 and 1907. So the Tsarist people were not very good. They were not good. But here they are in 1914 saying to the Armenians, we're with you. And if we win this war against Turkey, we will ensure that you will have a secure uh, national future uh, under our protection, under our protection. Uh, and the Armenians fell for it. Maybe they shouldn't have fallen for that uh, line, but it was very att attractive. And uh, as you uh, probably know, the Armenians did send their volunteer units all the way uh, to Erzurum and to Van uh, to, uh, to liberate them uh, then. But, uh, and it was hopeful. It was hopeful. Many of the Armenian refugees from 1915 who had uh, come to Echmiadzin and so forth, you know the story of the thousands of Vanetsis and others, uh, the story of Arshil Gorky and his family. Um, uh, these people returned to Van, they returned to Gadin, but in 1918, because of the situation with the Russian armies withdrawing or fleeing from the area under the urging of Lenin to leave the front, not only this front, but all the fronts, the German front, the Austrian front, and the Turkish front, uh, Armenia was in a serious uh, political uh, turmoil. Uh, Antronik, uh, of course, uh, well-known, probably the most uh, well-known Armenian uh, military figure in uh, modern Armenian history, much beloved uh, by the Armenian people, and the second, Droganayan, uh, again, a, a strong uh, military leader uh, whom I met uh, once in 1956 in Beirut um, uh, where he lived his uh, last, last years. These were people uh, who led the uh, Armenian volunteer detachments uh, in, uh, 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 under, the, under the auspices of the, um, the Russian army and uh, were bitterly disappointed, ultimately, uh, when they were abandoned and had to withdraw from Western Armenia uh, and uh, into uh, Eastern Armenia or uh, the current region. Uh, this brings us to 1918. Um, and I don't have a watch, so give me a signal, please. It's 7.30. All right. Uh, just tell, do this to me, okay? <laughs> the, um, bring us to 1918. Um, Caucasus in turmoil as well. Uh, the Caucasians, however much they were, had a dissatisfaction with the Russian regime, imperial regime, there was nonetheless security and protection with that Russian uh, armies nearby. Uh, when they all withdrew in 1918 from this region, and the Turkish armies, with their treaty with Soviet Russia, reclaimed these six provinces or part of the six provinces that had been occupied by Russia and then entered into cars and Ardahan, uh, the Armenians were in a panic situation uh, and they sought the support of their fellow Caucasian people, the Georgians to the north and the Muslims to the east and to the south. Uh, the leadership of the Georgians and the Muslims and the Armenians had a great deal in common.
they had been educated in, in the Russian system. Uh, if you looked at a picture of a Georgian leader or a Azeri leader or an Armenian leader, you really couldn't tell much difference if they dressed uh, more or less the same way as they did. Uh, and so they, they had commonalities. Uh, they uh, had been through the liberal and socialist uh, school of ideology. Um, they were uh, uh, advocates of democracy. Uh, and so one might think that they had enough in common where they would try to make a common stand <coughs> against the threat of the Turkish aggression. Uh, they didn't want to separate from Russia at that time, but they were forced to do so, and they tried to join together in an experiment of having a federation, a Caucasian federation, of Georgians, Armenians, Azerbaijanis, all taking in all of the South Caucasus and being a single state with constituent parts. But that experiment did not last. It lasted one month because the Turkish armies continued to advance uh, as far as Alexandropol. Uh, it seemed like the end of the Armenians was at hand. And at that critical moment, at that critical moment, um, I do not blame them. We can call them, uh, as we do in Armenian historiography, Tavajan Ner Yevailen, the Georgians, who looked for their own security. And they found their own security by signing a secret treaty with Germany. Germany was the ally of Turkey. And they could, if they quickly sent military forces from the Crimea, which the Germans had already occupied, the Krim, to Poti and uh, uh, other uh, ports, they could then stop the Turkish invasion of Georgia. And so they signed a secret agreement that put their lands under Turkey, uh, German uh, protection. And the agreement was that they would come out of this Transcaucasian fictional state. They would declare the independence of a Georgian republic. They would raise the German flag along with the <coughs> Georgian flag. And Georgian units, military units, would rush to the borders of the Tiflis Gubernia to stop the Turkish invasion and to direct the Turks southward toward Yerevan. The, direct, the, the Turks were going to move somewhere, so let's move them southward. And the Azeris, Azur, the Muslim population, again, with quite understandable, were sympathetic with the Turkish invaders because they shared a language, a religion, a culture in many ways. And so first the Georgians withdrew from this fictional state known as the Transcaucasian Federation on May 26, 1918. And that was followed a day or two later by the Muslim National Council declaring the independence of a Azerbaijan, a name that we had not heard before in the Caucasus, because Azerbaijan or Azerbaijan, for the uh, Armenians at least, was the area of Tavriz, northern Iran, is Azerbaijan. And uh, they came up with this name of Azerbaijan, perhaps because also in Azerbaijan there are Turkic Azeri kinds of people, and they were looking for uh, maybe a concept of uniting all of these lands under Azerbaijan. Amenayn Tebas, in any case, they declared the independence, surprisingly, of a state that had never existed before. And that was the Republic of Azerbaijan, with their temporary capital in Ganja, Ganzak, Kirovabad. 
uh, their temporary capital there because the Baku, which is a natural capital, was under the control of the Baku Soviet, made up of uh, uh, communists under Stepan Shahumyan and under Dashan uh, Fushun, military forces. So that in Baku you had an actual uh, coalition of communists and Dashnak uh, military. I mean, these are two political forces that don't like each other, and yet in Baku they collaborated in trying to defend uh, their city uh, from the Turkish invasion. And that left the Armenians in a lurch, because now Georgia had declared the independence of their state with the entire Tiflis gubernia, including Lodi, uh, Dashet, uh, in their uh, republic. Uh, the Azerbaijanis declared the independence of their country, incorporating eastern Transcaucasia and southern Transcaucasia. What does it mean by saying our state is eastern Transcaucasia and southern Transcaucasia without defining it? It meant everything, that they had their eyes on everything else that the Georgians didn't want. And it was under those circumstances that in May of 1918, the Armenian National Council in Tiflis debated for three days what they should do. And the decision was we have no other choice but also to declare that we are in control of the Armenian provinces of the Caucasus. And again, they didn't define their state. They didn't define it because it was not a definable state at the time. <coughs> um, it was in those days that uh, it seemed that the end of Yerevan was at hand. Uh, the Turkish armies had advanced to the gates of Yerevan at Bashabaram in the north and towards Sardarabad in the west. Sardarabad, as you know, is only a few kilometers from Echmiadzin, which is only a few kilometers from Yerevan itself. And if they so chose, probably within a day or two, the Turkish armies would have been in this city. Um, we now lionize the heroic struggle and defense of the Armenians at Sardarabad and Basha Baran. Uh, and uh, probably, indeed, we should. Indeed, the Armenians should do that. Um, they, for the first time, were able to stem the Turkish advances. I don't know for how long they could have done so if the Armenians and Turks had not signed this very humiliating treaty of Batum in June of 1918, in which Turkey recognized a minuscule, a very small Armenian state that became the foundation of the Republic of Armenia and that included Yerevan, Echmiadzin, and the southern shore of Lake Sevan, an area probably no more than eight or 10,000 square kilometers in which Armenia was to begin its existence. Uh, Simon Vratsyan, aside from his very large volume of Hayastani Hanara Beduchun, which, which was a fundamental source, uh, and which, really which quite... Edition of them? I'm the, sorry? The first edition or the second edition? The first edition. Thank you. 1928. Um, was a fundamental source uh, for the history, and surprisingly uh, quite objective for someone who had been in the government and had been a leader uh, of, of the Republic. Um, and uh, um, he wrote also six volumes of Gyanki Huinero, A Long Life's Way. And in one of those he describes the Battle of Sardarabad. Uh, and he says in Greek classical tragedies, in hopeless situations, there is the intervention of the gods, uh, known as Deus ex machina. And he showed that in, or he claimed that in 
Sadarabad was Deus ex machina, the unexpected intervention of the gods that brought the Armenian people in there, as he said, Drechavor, Pyrazin, Wotki Hametz, and defended uh, and stopped the Turkish uh, invasion and allowed for the creation of this little state. Uh, Aram Manukyan, whom you see on the left, was the only major Armenian leader in Yerevan at the time because the Armenian leadership was still in Tiflis. He is regarded in many by many people as the real founder of the Republic because he led the defense uh, there uh, uh, at Sardarabad along with his military people. And more attention probably has to be given to the regular army under General uh, Zoravar Tomas Nazarabekov, or Nazarabekian, the other picture, because there had been uh, several regular Armenian divisions or units from the Russian army that had been in Armenia and were very major, probably the fundamental sector of the defense of Sadarabad uh, was under their direction. If you see uh, what the Republic began with in these hash marks you see all the territories of Russian Armenia not Turkish Armenia but Russian Armenia Eastern Armenia that were lost in May of 1918 all of the region of Kars and Ardahan all of the district of Surmalu in the county uh, of uh, the province of Yerevan with Mount Ararat Masisa uh, so the Republic of Armenia, as you see where I have Republic of Armenia and compare it with what the Azerbaijanis claimed and controlled most of and what Georgia had and controlled most of, and this little Armenian Republic started in this uh, uh, territory uh, in an impossible situation. But as we hindsight, in hindsight, I call it a gift in disguise. It was a gift in disguise. We didn't recognize the importance of it at the time that it would become the foundation of Armenian hopes and aspirations uh, for a permanent, independent Armenian state. Um, to the east, even after the Armenian little state was recognized by Turkey, uh, Armenians and Russians and others still fought for Baku under the leadership of Stepan Shaumian, a close associate of Lenin, uh, who was later betrayed uh, and sent into Central Asia to be shot along with other leaders of the Baku uh, defense uh, commune. And only in September of 1918, that is four months after uh, the establishment of Azerbaijan, uh, did the Turkish armies succeed with the Azeri forces uh, entering Baku where the last massacre of the Armenians took place on September 14, 15, 1918, with some 12,000 more Armenians becoming victims to the Turkish uh, atrocities, and the remaining Armenians fleeing southward toward uh, Enzeli Resht into Iran, or to Krasnovodsk, or to Astrakhan in the north. Finally, I'm going to end in shortly to look at the first government of Armenia. It was a question of who, who should lead. Uh, the party Tashnachtichun had been dominant in uh, Caucasia since the armeno tatar Wars, since the time of the confiscation of the properties uh, of the Armenian church under the time of Khrimian Haidik. They became very popular and they won every election there was uh, on a local level. In the Armenian National Council in Tiflis, they also had 
a very large um, presence. Uh, one of the most uh, respected leaders of the party was Holonis Ivan uh, Kashasnani. And it was decided that he should form the first Armenian government. Uh, that also was very difficult. Uh, he wanted to have a coalition government of other parties, but those parties did not want to join the government at that time. Uh, it, it was so hopeless. It was so hopeless. So he ended up forming a very small government of a few people, and then the decision was, um, how do we transfer to, or should we transfer to Yerevan? Or should we remain in Tiflis as the Armenian government outside the country? Uh, ultimately, the decision was made, and in July of 1918, um, now May, June, July, that is two months uh, after the declaration of Armenian independence, the first Armenian cabinet took a, a terrible, dirty little train um, to uh, Dilijan or uh, Karakilise or whatever uh, at that time, and from there by automobile made their way to Yerevan to begin trying to govern a country with thousands of hungry, diseased people and no previous existing real government. That was their challenge. Uh, these were the people whom they saw when they arrived in Yerevan, the children, the thousands of orphans everywhere in the streets, beggars and orphans lying in exposed uh, homes. Uh, I've been here in winter. You know how cold and freezing and the blizzards and the winds can be and these poor children lying out exposed on the streets. And you can understand why so many thousands perished in the winter of 1918 and 1919, the first terrible winter in the Armenian Republic. Kevor uh, Kingeror, the Catholicos, had a great um, outpouring of sympathy and tried to protect as many as these children in Echmiazin uh, as he could. And it, uh, they, I think they called him in Armenian Vushtali. Uh, full of sorrow, full of sorrowful Catholicos because of the, what he saw and witnessed uh, in, in that year. And finally, in 1918 August, the Armenians decided that they needed to have not only a cabinet, government, uh, led by Kachas Nuni, and uh, with Aram Manugyan as the Minister of Interior, but also that they should have a legislative body. It was impossible to have national elections, but the Armenian leaders were committed to the concept of parliamentary government and democratic institutions. So even in those most trying of times, even in those most trying of times, uh, they created the Armenian legislature, which they named um, Khorurta, Khorurta. And what they did is they took the number of representatives that they had in Tiflis on the Armenian National Council. Tashnat Sagan, Jovurtagan, Social Democrat Ner. And they tripled their numbers. So if there were... Um, uh, six members of the Tashnak Shun on the National Council, they became 18 deputies. If there were three Jean uh, Urtagan, uh, they became six uh, and so forth. And that way, the first <coughs> Armenian legislature uh, uh, was formed. The speaker of the legislature, the president of the legislature, was uh, again, a, a beloved old revolutionary by the name of Avedik Sahakyan. Gusak Sagan Anuna Haira Brahmer. And Avedik uh, Sahakyan gave a really an impressive speech at, at the opening, at the opening session. Um, 
at the opening session. Uh, because in the Balkan were seated the German representative, the Austrian representative, the Turkish representatives were sitting up there because they were, uh, 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 you know, the Turkish armies were uh, uh, six miles or 10, 12 kilometers away. Uh, with, their, with their artillery, they could hit Yerevan. They were that close. And even under those conditions, uh, Haider Abraham uh, made, uh, made this uh, statement. Uh, he, 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 he reviewed the tragic events that had, uh, ended, uh, uh, that had ended with the Declaration of Independence, but he was optimistic. He said, although this, the, 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 the Republic was small in size, deprived of its best lands, and unable to provide for all of its citizens, Armenia's boundaries would not remain inflexible forever. That they would not stay in these very constricted few thousand kilometers. History would change that. And he said, I believe that our borders will expand with the iron force of life, with the defense of our just and indisputable rights to the occupied lands. And he's saying this in the presence of the Turkish victors who have taken all these territories, saying, we will not succumb and remain within these narrow boundaries, but our boundaries will expand. And uh, indeed they did, because within two months, three months after that, Turkey was defeated, the Ottoman Empire was defeated, Germany was defeated by the Allied powers, and the little republic that had started down by Lake Sevan and south of Lake Sevan expanded first by taking the half of the plain of Ararat, which had been occupied by the Turkish armies, and Alexandropol, which had been occupied by the Turkish armies, and expanded farther all into the great fortress city of Kars. And so the first formation of the Armenian Republic had come to fruition with a state that had started with 8,000 square kilometers, now becoming four times larger and giving hope to the refugees that they could uh, return home. And in the first instance, the Armenians who had fled from Alexandropol, who had fled from Kars, who had fled from many of the towns and villages of Kars, were able to return home in the spring of 1919, giving hope to the Turkish Armenians, to the Western Armenians, that Vara, tomorrow, will be our turn when the Allied powers fulfill their promises, fulfill their pledges to rescue the Armenians from the blasting tyranny of the Turks and allow a national secure future for the Armenian people. And that is how the first phase of the formation, an unexpected creation of an Armenian state. In the unexpected place, Yerevan was not where the Armenians anticipated an autonomous or a free Armenian state. It was Van. It was Garin. That was where the whole concept of the Armenian liberation movement was. But history plays tricks. Uh, and here, the trick that was played is that Yerevan, the last expected place, became the capital and remained the capital of the Armenian Republic. Uh, next time, I want to talk about politics, about the formation of the state, about the issues of Western Armenians and Eastern Armenians, about the creation of a coalition government when the non-Armenian or the non-Tashtakshin parties saw that there would be possibility of a future for this state. They agreed to join in a coalition government and brought to uh, the Republic a great deal of expertise in economic, judicial, and other matters. Thank you very much for today. Yes. I forgot to make an announcement. We have a reception in our Hakan Gallery, fourth floor in this building. Uh, you can go up by the elevators, uh, but maybe 
Uh, would you like to have, we can have uh, conversations with Professor Hovannissian there, or if, uh, if you'd like to entertain a few questions. We can do two. Yes. Two three. I am. Dear Professor, I think that you participate in the Centennial. I'm not hearing well. Dear Professor, I think you will be in Yerevan second half of May this year. You will yes, be. I think I will be. After all the ceremonies, I am inviting you to go the 1st of June to Akhal Kalak, uh, uh, uh. to Satcha. No one mentions this battle, battle of Satcha, where the Armenians stopped the remnants of Turkish army who defeated in Sardarabad and going toward Tbilisi. Fortunately, I participated a few times in the last 10 years. So, thank you. Second, do you think what is happening now in the streets of Yerevan is aspire, inspire us to achieve what we call it democracy? For me, sir, no. It's a show business badly manipulated by the authorities. As bad show business done in Syria before you, your army, 100 tomahawks, never killed anyone, and before that what happened in Duma as chemical weapons. Oh. The so last what? one is the question. <laughs> I have no answers for no. you. Yes, all right, yeah. Russia donated gas first time to the Turks, but the second time only after two years. Who donated gas to Kazim Karabakir army? Uh, you, I, uh, I, I wouldn't call it donated, you, you want, if you, unless you call a military collapse. There was a military collapse of the cars, which I'll talk about uh, on Friday, but um, I think you're referring to the fact that the Armenian army did not defend as they should have defended cars. Is that what you mean? The government, not the army. Well, it was the army that fell apart. Uh, and uh, then, of course, uh, it was Moscow that put the stamp of approval on giving away cars to, to Turkey, but these are interesting historical facts, and thank you. Yes. Professor, I want to ask, uh, in case, I want to ask this, uh, if Armenia was able to expand uh, beyond the borders yeah. uh, from when it was established, why didn't they continue toward the sea or toward Mount Ararat and take those territories as well? What, what they, say it again. If they were able to expand the territory to Alexandropol, for example, yeah, yeah. why didn't they continue oh, that further? Because they, they further could not, it was occupied by the Turkish armies and the Armenian army was not strong enough on its own to expel the Turkish armies from all those areas, and that's what the Allied powers uh, were supposed to do. Uh, they were, it was under their, um, uh, under their watch, and they, of course, uh, demanded the withdrawal, uh, but the Turkish armies under Mustafa Kemal and the resistance movement did not, uh, and so uh, the Armenians were let down. They thought that they would be uh, supported by the victors in World War I, who had made many promises and pledges regarding the restitution, the restoration of the Armenian people. But on the, you know, the Armenia was a small country with refugees and a very small army. Uh, put together, uh, there may have been 20,000 men under arms, not well equipped, and they were fighting on all fronts. They fought in the north, they were fighting, they had to have, they had to have uh, armed forces uh, in, in Surmalu, they had to have armed forces in Nakh toward Nakhichevan border, they had to have armed forces facing Zangezur, they had to have armed forces in Lori, and so the, the number of troops available for a, a strong operation to occupy this vast area was beyond the capability of the Armenians at the time, and without external support, that would not happen, and ultimately it did not happen, 
and that's why those territories remain beyond the borders. There was no way that they could take them. The Armenian population had been destroyed in that area. There was no base, na national base of support from the local population of an Armenian uh, army coming in because there were no Armenians left there. I think given the time, we should... May, well, we have one person standing. Let's, let's do that. Oh, Sorry. Uh, I, I don't even know how to formalize the question, but um, first of all, thank you very much for today's lecture. Um, it's I've never been gripped so uh, intently and haven't even checked my phone for once. So uh, thank you very much. Um, the question of the elite, you often talked about in your, in your speech about uh, in Tbilisi, the Armenian yeah. political elite playing a key role in, in the entire process of, of the formation of the First Republic. Um, is there a similar story about the Armenian political intellectual elite in, in Istanbul? And often the sense that one gets is that there is a disdain, maybe a word, uh, kind of the rural areas of Armenia yeah. were not seen as yeah. part of. Yeah. What about that? And, and, and then how do these imperial powers, how do they use this elite to, to control the regions? Well, I think that continues to Yeah, uh, it, it's uh, uh, somewhat ironic, but true. Uh, that the major centers of Armenian life in both Western and Eastern Armenia were outside the historic Armenian homelands. Cultural center, economic center, political centers had uh, grown up in uh, one instance, the capital of the Caucasus, uh, where the Namisnik uh, or the Viceroy of the Caucasus was in Tiflis. Uh, the major city uh, remains a remarkably beautiful and wonderful city. Uh, and so all of the uh, and, the, and the Armenians felt very much at home there. When, you know, when you're part of the Russian Empire, it doesn't make much too much difference in that you feel comfortable where you are. I mean, these people have connections everywhere. There, 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 there's a network. And you know, I experienced this as a student when I went to Beirut. I returned to California the opposite direction through Asia. And I stopped in 20 different communities, and everywhere I knew Armenians, I found Armenians, and they told me who the next Armenians were in the next community. And so this network, and so the Tiflis Armenians felt very, very comfortable where they were. They could, you know, they had a networks in, in Moscow, in Rostov, Nakhchivan, in, Tif, in Baku, and so forth. And the same is true in Constantinople, which uh, uh, attracted, attra attract, was a secure city, uh, which was a Europeanized, relatively Europeanized city, uh, very different from the country bumpkins, unfortunately, historical Armenian lands, both in Eastern Armenia and in Western Armenia, had become uh, rural, eyes, uh, no major cities existed anymore. You know, uh, we talk about Ani. Ani was a huge medieval city, but there were no cities like that left in the 18th and 19th century. I mean, the largest of these were Van and, and Erzurum, uh, and these were not advanced cities at all. They, they were living in um, cultural backwardness. But one of the things that we must say also is that the move and push of the Armenians to achieve en enlightenment and cultural immediately separated them in the Ottoman Empire from their Muslim neighbors and became certainly one of the causes for envy uh, and differentiation that would also contribute uh, to the Ar Armenian genocide. So Bolis absolutely is a, the, the Western Armenian Tiflis, and yes, the authorities work through the elites to control uh, their people. Uh, they work through the patriarchate, uh, and in the Persian times here, they work through uh, the Katholikos of Echviadzin to uh, uh, to, to gain the sympathy and uh, uh, obedience and taxation uh, of, their, uh, of their people. The elites profit from this. The Tiflis elites profit uh, from this as well. Uh, and so there is this divide between elite and, and the common people, even though, even though we find out that ultimately the elites are the ones also who become the reformers and the spokespeople for change. And, and reform within within the system.
Thank you very much. Yeah.